Welcome to Self-Publishing Authors, home for candid talks and honest recommendations from book editing to book marketing, from author journeys to inspirations, hosted by Gurhan Demirkan. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are here again with Nancy Leonard. And Hello. she just put out one book, right? Do I want to hear the name of the book? Go ahead, Nancy. Cast No Shadow. Cast No Shadow. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, yeah, sometimes I, I waver for months on what to call it, but this was just so obvious. The book basically, and we'll get into it, involves uh, a young man who has had his morality and life completely ruined by a psychopathic parent. And <laughs> to the point that he is so diminished and his self-worth and how he perceives himself gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So he's not even sure that he can cast a shadow anymore. Uh -huh. And that's, that's a low point. So we'll just leave it at that. But that's where the title came from. That's where the title came from. Cast No Shadow. Right. Well, I remember uh, doing the uh, cover and I remember your instructions. You know, how you specifically said, this guy has to look this way. And it needs to be that way, you know? So now we know why all these things all, you know, intricate parts of the uh, cover. Cast it's, no shadow. Okay. Yeah. Um, the books have been evolving, you know, as you know, Gurhan, I've been writing for 11 years now. And they keep getting um, deeper is too simple a word, but more introspective, more... Um, integrating with the modern world. Um, mm -hmm. It's been an intellectual journey. And I'm particularly proud of Cast No Shadow because it's sort of another evolution into the real world. Um, we were talking about what to call it, you know, like what genre. Uh -huh. And it's, it's very difficult to classify. Um, most of my books are because they're not, they don't fit into simplistic little categories. In fact, as you know, this book won a contest. Um, I was a mm -hmm. finalist, second place actually among hundreds of people. Um, and we, I didn't know what to enter it under as far as category. Huh? And after we eliminated everything, um, we came up with it had to be mainstream. It was serious enough. Um, it had had a lot of intricacies that that eliminated from simple genre work. So um, yeah, it's very involved in a lot of ways and we'll talk more about it. But so when it you is. entered the book into the uh, competition, uh, it's not, it's unlike Amazon. They have like 16,000 or 160,000 or something like that uh, genres. Uh, I guess uh, you had limited genres. Yeah, there's, there's like um, six or seven areas. Okay. Um, genre fiction is one of them. Mainstream fiction is another one. Women's okay. fiction is, is another one. Um, mystery um, thriller is another one, which is okay. probably the closest second place. Yeah. Yes. So. But it had to be mainstream. That's what I'm writing these days is mainstream stuff. So. Hey, these days. Okay, in these days. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're gonna get to that. Okay, so you wrote this book. Yes, we published it, and uh, it's all out there. My question to you is: any particular reason why you wrote this book? Um, if you know anything about writing, <laughs> one a little things, bit, <laughs> a little bit. I know you do. Uh, one of the things that inspires readers to continue reading a book is unanswered questions. In other words, um, you build tension by asking a question that needs to be answered and the reader can't stand it until they, they keep going and find the answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. That happens over and over in my books. Um, it's one of my strong suits, I know. And in, the, in particular, this book, the whole book, was an answer to a que that question that was raised in the second book, oh. two books ago. It had a whole other area of um, concentration, but one of the key questions that was never answered 
is why would these two affluent young men be driven? I don't want to let too much out of the book, but to attempt an, <laughs> an assault, what would have led them in their lives to do dastardly things? Okay. okay. It was never answered, but I had to answer it. I had to. And um, there was a book in the middle, a third book, mm -hmm. but I knew that it, 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 Terry Persona and I talk about it a lot. There are sometimes you have to write, you have to. It bugs you. It's like a little nudge. It's right at the back of your head. <laughs> yeah, that you, yeah, you can't let it go. And and the question was, what could have possibly driven these two young men to this situation? Okay, that's it. So, so the write. reason actually is coming from the previous books, right? Okay, it was one final big question that was left unanswered. Okay, that I had to answer in my own mind too. Okay. So this is all fictional, right? And it has nothing to do with personal or any story that you heard, anything like that? Sort of. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the question that needs to be answered, right? Yes. No, no, we have to answer the question. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Back in, I wrote the book, and one of your questions was, when did you write it? Yes. The book was literally written in about 2015. Wow. Okay. Um, the first draft, and that's a whole other story. But like I said, I had a question, I had to answer it. And so that's when I answered it. Um, that was before, I hate to get into anything that's vaguely related to politics, but that was before the Donald Trump era. <laughs> And it was also when I've always thought um, family dynamics are very interesting. Mm -hmm. And you wonder what, how people's lives would be different with more constructive parenting versus very destructive parenting. Mm -hmm. that, that, was, that was what led me into this. Um, which, which we'll also talk about later, but it has something to do with psychopathic behavior. And again, what could have driven two young men to be so self-destructive? Okay. It's the dynamics. And, and okay. like I said, it was written way back in 2015, but you've got to admit there are some modern day implications to what I've written. Uh, the book, you, did you start this book in 2015 or did you finish the first draft in 2015? Well, when I generally, when I finish your first draft, the plot is done. The characters are done. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 it's turning it from a, a lump of clay that's sort of fashioned into a sculpture into the finished product. I fine tuned it over a period of time in multi editors. And we can talk about that later too. But the story itself was completed probably in four to five months in 2015. And okay. it really has not changed at all as far as the underlying story. It was done. It flowed onto the paper and it was completed that year. 2015. And why would you wait until 2000? When did we publish this? 22, right? 22, awesome. right. Yes. What, what, why, why the difference? Um, okay. Um, publishers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, right, question. Maybe I shouldn't ask this question. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's really important and it's really vital that, um, that people understand the challenges of the publishing world right now. Um, there are fewer and fewer major publishers. It's like every other large business. They're consolidating and consolidating. Yes. And when you do that, you start focusing on, on money and how can we maximize profits. And that means fewer writers. And that means just a very few of the big names and then advertising and promote them yes. beyond belief. Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, one of the publishers that picked up the book um, also published my third book. 
Um, but they were primarily romance authors. Mm -hmm. Now, I was glad to get the book out, but it was not what I write, wrote. And they were seducing me into thinking that they were going to expand into all these other areas. But they didn't. And they didn't do the background advertising and work. Oh. So what I'm trying to say is that it took a while for us to realize that we were not a good fit. Okay. And then I was in, involved with other books and then COVID hit and I just kept writing. And finally, finally, I had to get serious about it. And so that's what happened. And you cool. found the best guy ever. It took a while to find the best. Yes. That's what I should have said. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to exactly. put a big sign on the screen. It was me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you you are a hybrid. And yeah. and it works really well, I think, in the modern world. And I think it's going to be outstandingly good. Yes. But um, we'll see. But um, I'm very pleased so far. So far. So far, so good. <laughs> so far, so good. So uh, 2015... This book is finished. 2022, we publish it. We did the uh, cover and everything else. And uh, in, did you do any research on this book? You know, when you're writing, you said uh, psychopath dad and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Um, it's one of the absolute pleasures of being a writer, at least as the way I look at it, because it opens up avenues of interest. Um, I went to college a long time ago, and I wish I wish I was a freshman going to college now. I would have followed my interest and my passion rather than just take rote classes. Now I have an opportunity, and with the internet, everything that's available, my gosh, and the books, nonfiction and fiction that are coming out, mm -hmm. you can explore anything in depth, anything, and it's like, I, I feel like a kid in a candy store because I'll start writing a book and it's, I don't write superficial books. In this particular situation, there were three areas of research that I spent a fair amount of time on. It was not painful because I was interested in all of them. Um, one of them was the Blackfeet culture. And I actually got involved with that um, in the second book. And the novels just happened to be centered in northwestern Montana, up in the Glacier Park area. Now, they go all over the world now, as you know, wow. the Middle East, um, Middle East. East Europe, different places. But I, if I'm going to write and place a book somewhere, I need to understand their modern points of view. And what, what brought them to that place, because that's integral into the characters that I create. Now, these are secondary characters in, in Cast No Shadow, mm -hmm. but they're very important. And so um, I think I may have mentioned before, um, I've had a, a series of editors that I continue to work with for different yes. pieces of the pie. In this particular situation, I cultivated a young Blackfeet woman. She was, I think, like 30, 30 when I started. She's now um, like me, you know, it's been 10 <laughs> years. So we have been friends and, um, and uh, partners in the editing process for all this time. When, when she read this book, Cast No Shadow, she said, you've got you've got some of our weaknesses in the book and she's encouraged that she's even taken me to some of her failing family connections that are that have had drug and alcohol problems and you know different things she's not pollyanna mm -hmm. in this culture okay but she said you need to know and maybe you can work it into the book a couple of, of pieces of our history that made us who they are Okay, there. Are, so there, are, I've done I've done fairly extensive reading into Blackfeet history, but two major events that determined their outlook. One was the Marias River massacre. I think it was in um, eighteen seventy, fairly late, 
and it was you know um in the scale of wounded knee and um you know big deal the american army was searching for two natives that had stolen some horses it's a long story they had literally murdered a white guy who needed murdering but we won't go into that <laughs> okay <laughs> So the army was out there looking for these two guys. They couldn't find them, but they stumbled across um, a village of 200 plus Blackfeet women, old men, children, and they just killed them all. Wow. Okay. Uh, it's not as well known. Uh, a few people escaped. Uh, Margie, my friend, her name is Margie Yellow Kidney, which I love. <laughs> But she has relatives that were some of the few people that literally hid in the snow banks and under creek ledges and survived that massacre. Okay. Um, the second instance involved, and I, I'm sure you've been hearing too, about the, uh, the school programs where they yes. took children away from their families. Yes. It was going on in Blackfeet country until the 1970s. And again, my friend Margie has relatives that um, were, were some of those children that were taken away from their families. And you can imagine the psychological overlay yes. um, from these types of traumas, both of these. Well, family traumas carry on. And you can imagine that there are some parallels between that, her experience, and what happened with my main character in the book, uh -huh. with physical abuse and the carryover. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was fairly easy um, to connect the two. Um, it's not a huge deal in the book, but it's there. And I'm very grateful to her for the level of involvement that she's shown and how it fit. It makes my books better. It's okay. Yes, of course, yes. All right. Fiction with real life input exactly exactly yes. because you don't make up um the human dynamics they're there yes, yes. the fiction writer embellishes yes. so let's let's put this in a timeline you said the book was finished within five months or something yeah okay and you have to do research how long would that take well the the blackfeet research um I had been ongoing for several years because okay. um I I set the first book in Blackfeet country okay the the other two areas um uh, one was prison reform and the okay. need of that so you you did a research on prison reform exactly okay um many people don't know that we have the highest incarceration rate in the world more than Iran more than Russia <laughs> um, 4.2% of the people of um, Americans are in currently in prison. And that's an improvement over the last three or four years, but it's incredible. Um, we have, I have a young family friend who had a girlfriend that came from, I think Bavaria. And we, this is several years ago, we got into a conversation about, how hard they work to prevent recidivism. In other words, they evaluate their prisoners. They retrain mm -hmm. them. They help them become productive members of society. Completely different from what we do in this country. We're thrown and, in there. And and again, um, I don't like I don't like to lecture in my books, but if I have an opportunity to bring a problem into focus, uh -huh. I do. And my, one of my characters went to prison. And again, it was another opportunity to delve more deeply uh, okay. into another area. Um, see, there was another area. Oh, well, and of course, um, psychopathic personality yes. and behavior. Okay. That's a, that's a dad. Yeah. And these, both the prison situation and, mm -hmm. um, Psycho psychopathic behavior. They were not year-long studies. I mean, there's a lot of material. 
Yes. But I, I bothered to pull up a lot of information and read about psychopathic behavior. I mean, a lot of people just think that, you know, there's only one kind and they go out and kill everybody. No, 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 no. Most psychopaths um, manipulate other people for their own gains. Oh. And, they, and they have no guilt about it. That's what makes them different. Whatever, whatever they want is most important. How it affects other people is completely irrelevant. Okay. Um, you may want to you may want to shorten this and edit it, but it's a great story. <laughs> okay, let's see. <laughs> um, I was I was uh, watching a documentary during this period on psychopathic behavior. It was excellent, and he was talking about some of the things I'm talking about. He was a PhD, was somebody you know, middle aged mm -hmm. guy, and he they have determined genetic markers. In other words, psychopathic behavior is both genetic and behavioral. Uh -huh. Okay. It's a, it's a disease. It's 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 part disease and mm -hmm. part learned. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um they have literally identified genetic markers. You know, they're doing all this gene evaluation mm -hmm. right now in the modern world. And they identified 18 genetic predeterminers of genetic behavior, okay? To test his theory, he thought he'd get a bunch of normal people. So he gathered a bunch of people, they take blood tests, they evaluate their genes, including a lot of his family members. And, uh, you know, I'm, I don't remember the number, but let's say several hundred. Mm -hmm. out, of, out of his 30 family members, there was only one person who had a large percentage of these predetermining genes. And it was him. Oh. <laughs> and he couldn't believe it. Um, he came from a very nurturing family. Um, he didn't look on himself as being abnormal. Uh -huh. He just couldn't believe it. He was the only one. So he went to, fan to, to some of his friends. He had a lot of friends and said, is this possible? And they all laughed and said, of course. Your greatest fun is putting us in uncomfortable situations yes. and then laughing at us and enjoying them. Okay. So um, it's, it's interesting. Yes, um, it is very interesting. And again, I get to incorporate some of the stuff that I learned into the books. Okay, so the magic of writing is actually not just sitting there and thinking about these fictional things for you. You're doing research and you have these characters, sometimes from real life, sometimes you, you know, may, maybe the main character or the uh, secondary characters. Mm -hmm. You create these characters and you actually apply the main life events or happenings or whatever into the life you kind of like submerge them in there it's not all fictional it's not all you know history yes it's just all commingled it, it's uh writing is really amazing nice. uh, as you know i didn't start it until after i retired from the real world and raising children <laughs> from real world but um yeah, I mean, you can take it anywhere you want to. And it's um, thought provoking, to say the least. And you're, you're right, the integration between fiction and the yes. real world. And the real world. It's just yeah. fabulous. Nice. Um, what about the theme? You were talking about the theme? Okay. Um, there, there are overriding themes that that appear in books from ancient Greece okay. <laughs> on through. Um, th let's start with um, uh, uh, trust issues. Sorry, let me turn this down. Um, uh, personal failure, the possibility of redemption, um, uh, perseverance, um, Again, uh, failure. Um, the theme of this particular book 
was the possibility of redemption. Redemption. And, okay. and you can fake it a lot as a human being. Um, you can lie to yourself a lot. Um, but way down inside until you're really tested, often you don't really know if you've really changed or not. <laughs> and um, there's one particular conversation in the book that I'm particularly proud of. Let's see if I can get this right. I have an older lady in the book who, who goes throughout the series or the my books in general. She's sort of the, the aging philosopher. Mm -hmm. And she's interrogating one of the young men that we're talking about to try to find out if he's dangerous, if he should be given a second chance or not. Okay. So she asks him all these questions and he he tells her he's he just um, it, he will not do these dastardly things again because he's learned mm -hmm. his father who who is this horrible person who manipulated him into these things is no longer a threat we won't explain why okay but he said no i i'm good to go but she just sits there and looks at him she knows he's not done not yet <laughs> and and he knows that he hasn't completely bared his soul yet so finally he says to her deep sigh okay um and he he went to prison and had plenty of time to think this over and he said i have decided there are three kind of, kinds of people on this planet there are some people who would never under any circumstance do horrible dastardly things murder assault whatever never no matter what the motivation they would never do it there's another type let's call it the third type that you give them any incentive money power whatever they would do anything and not have a have conscience in the, stricken about it let's yes. call them psychopaths and then he says and then there's the second choice and they're the middle ground who if you think given the right situation and motivation you could be driven to do almost anything he said that's where i think i am i think uh -huh. i'm in the middle and i'm going to have to guard against that nature that part of myself for the rest of my life okay so that so there you are um uh, those kind of choices and dilemmas that's the theme and is that good enough Will that old lady say, okay, I believe you, you're good enough that we will let you be part of our lives? Or will she say, not good enough? So the reader will have to read the book. <laughs> read the book. And only an author can come up with this. <laughs> really. <laughs> I, I'm proud of that particular thing. And it's also true. Very nice. I, yes. Yes. I, when, when, when I find a piece of human nature that seems to just scream out at me as a basic truth uh -huh. that is put it down <laughs> yeah. one, one, one of my themes that i i laugh because i think i've mentioned it to you um human nature and and the world we exist in that there there is no fairness there are only choices i'm going to have it put on t-shirts and sell them at yard sales <laughs> but but it, you know, if you expect life to be fair, good luck. But yes. life is a series of choices, like this young man was saying. You know, the choice to be good or evil is presented, you know, various mm -hmm. various opportunities throughout our lives, um, various less serious choices. But it's interesting, isn't it? The yes. choice to make. Yes. Well, okay, so that's the theme. And what about the structure? You know? Okay. <laughs> uh, first, 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 let me ask you this. Um, did you come up with the structure at the beginning or at the structure just got developed? Uh, 
I've read a lot. I've read a lot in my life. Uh If you look, my bookshelf looks like your bookshelf. Um, I, in my earlier years, particularly, I read a lot of novels. And I think I absorbed novel structure completely naively, but I had read so much, it became part of what I did. But mm-hmm. if you're asking me if I had any kind of a structural plan before I started writing, no. Oh. But if you, um, I recently came across what I think is one of the best um, summaries of structure that I've ever read. One of them is because it's so simple. And I literally just came across it, Gurhan. It was in the um, Pacific Northwest Writers Association newsletter. And it, it talked about the structure of the novel. So I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Printed it out and, and started going through, actually I went through just cast no shadow to see if if the structure that I came across recently uh-huh. was in keeping with the structure of that book. Oh. Strangely, um, identical. If I had if I had read that, had it beside my computer when I did the first draft, uh-huh. it perfectly followed that structure. It's it was exciting. And in that particular book, this particular book, um, yes, it, it there's a and I, I, I there's no getting around. I will look at it in the future um, because it's the way novels progress. So without even knowing, just because you had this structure internalized, mm-hmm. you wrote the book according to the structure, which you learn afterwards. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, as you know, I'm part of a writer's group. We've met for six years uh-huh. and we critique our work. And um, I, I'm going to be talking about this at the at their next meeting. I just think it's it's incredibly important. Not that you can't change it, but you ought to know what you're changing. You know, you uh-huh. if you're gonna if you're gonna remove one of these pieces, then you need to replace it with something else. Okay. Um, you can't just throw it away. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I don't know if this is the place, but maybe sometime else, whatever you want to do it. Okay. Um, we can go through the five categories. Oh yeah, that would be great. Actually, that would be very nice for the uh, you know people who would like to be authors. Yes, you know. exactly, exactly. Yeah. And um, in this particular book, did, I, I just re-skimmed the book yesterday because I wanted it really fresh in my mind when I talked mm-hmm. to you today. And the fourth area of the five that I'm talking about is the climax. It's what we've been working through, mm-hmm. through 90% of the book. The reader knows it's coming. The author knows it's coming. Oh my gosh. In this case, you can imagine what the climax is going to be. It's that same question that that old lady said. How do you know that you can control yourself? Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't know. And the reason that was honest, he hadn't been placed in in a situation that was all or none. Had yes. he, how much was he willing to sacrifice, possibly his life, for these new principles that he hoped were part of him? Okay, that's all I'll say. Okay. But when we get to the very, that's the climax of the book. I won't tell you what happens. No, no, that's not, that's not you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great. It's, so it's, it's most of. Uh, yeah. That's great. So it climbs up, climbs up, climbs up, and it's reckoning. Yeah, and the reader's going, <laughs> what's he going to do? What's he going to do? Yeah, yeah, what's he going to do? And, <laughs> um, and I did not know myself, really. I didn't. Nice. Well, that's you, a true uh, artist, though. That's that's author. It was, um, I had, you know, I had a pretty good idea. But the, the this particular, there, there was a climax before that. Won't go into it. Uh-huh. But that would have probably been enough. But it for me, it wasn't. 
because it didn't really answer that question. We had to get to this secondary climax. <laughs> so it's, this like a, it's like one climax. Does it, does it go climax and winds down and up climax or just find climax, yeah, up, 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 up and another climax? It didn't really answer the question that the old lady asked. Ah, okay, yes. Until so I got to the second one. Must read. This is exciting. This must is exciting. read, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so all this good. So tell us if you're going to write a sequel. Well... Well, let, let me let me just do this. You're work, you're working on six more books, right? Six, five, six. Um, there are nine of them that are that are completed first drafts, and you know that I'm working on an espionage novel now. Yes, but that's going to take probably a couple years because I'm having to go back to college and learn about espionage. Yes. Uh -huh. But um, yes. Um, when I do sequels, we don't, I don't do, I don't, let's see, what can I say that's, that's comparable? It's not like Harry Potter where you have the same central characters that go on through the book. Uh -huh. um, my, my series is much looser than that. And it's again, my series are answers to questions that are brought up. Okay, so strangely, the, some of the characters that are in this fourth book, Cast No Shadow, are definitely carried on, mm -hmm. but their but their their resolution is done at least temporarily. But there may be other questions that were created, okay. and so those are the questions that go on into later books. So if you're saying, "Are there sequels?" It's already done. There's okay. several of them. In fact. Several of the characters from this book, yes, yes, but that, but their their questions are different, and okay. this, and the central protagonist, is different. Okay. Yes. So the main characters are already done. Tem right? At least so far. So yeah. far, yes. Yeah. And the uh, sequel doesn't mean the same characters, you know, just following the first book and the second book and the third book. Yeah. Of it's course, just... though, that when I create these characters, I'm totally in love with them, flawed though they may be, and they don't go away permanently. Uh -huh. But as far as the major, you know, in the next book, they may appear in a dominant way three books down the line. Yes. Uh, I, I think it's very, very, very rare when somebody writes a series of books when they haven't been published frankly Gurhan, it's a fabulous opportunity because i can go back and tweak things and add questions and the fifth book that you know that i'm working really hard on editing with with um beth um my major editor mm -hmm. um creates a character and we're and we're, we're talking about the middle east and eastern europe and a spy and an espionage thing in a small part but whammo, five months later, uh -huh. is the whole kahuna. Yes. So um, it, it's it's like, I think, and I'm not sure about this, but the lady who wrote the Harry Potter series, I think she had like six or seven books drafted before she got her first book published. She put them out and, you know, tried to find publishers for a long time. Yes, before for a long time. Accepted. Yes. Um, in my case, it's a fab it was a fabulous opportunity because I could ask a lot of these questions and build interest in some of these characters. So when I write a book, I don't ha necessarily have to go back to the ground mm -hmm. zero. Yes. My is already, already done. done. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's part of it's part of the thing of, of um hooking a reader. Yes. Um, and it's one of those five categories. The very first one, it's called exposition. And in the olden days, let's see, when would I say that is? More than 20 years ago, <laughs> people didn't worry about hooking the reader so much in the first few pages. Now, maybe they did in like spaghetti novels or whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. But an author could take a long time to develop a hook. Okay. 
generally a reader would go, I loved their last three novels. I know I'm going to love the next one. So it doesn't matter if I get to page 100 before I really get interested. Yes, thank you for reading. That's not the way it is anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's not hard for me. I do that really well um, to build interest really early. And um, it's easier. My hooks are already in previous books. Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All I have to do is embellish them a little, and yeah. the reader is off and gone. So oh, Nice. Now, we, we should talk about those maybe later, you know, in our next episodes, because uh, that would be a good point, actually, for upcoming authors. And along with uh, some other stuff. In fact, we may even uh, want to include Terry. You know, Terry is a master. You know, he's a teacher. Yeah, yeah we should um, include Yeah, him. and, you know... Um... I've considered doing some lectures with the um, Pacific Northwest Writers Association too. One of them is is research, you know, which we've already talked about, but uh -huh. I believe in it so strongly. Um, you know, if I'm gonna write a book, my, my reader's gonna learn something by reading it that they didn't know, and they're gonna be glad they learned it. Yes, because so, of the research. Um, yeah, so book research and those five areas of yeah. structure um, that, that's a good backbone for a... Maybe a maybe topic. next time we'll talk about those. Okay, sounds great. Okay. All right. Well, those are my questions all about the book. And uh, the only thing that I have to say is, go read it. I right? know. Yeah. yeah, I mean... Cast but, no shadow. I can guarantee you will, uh, you will learn something. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's like first climax, second climax... Come on, you know. <laughs> Maybe I'll call it next book Breathless. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thanks, Gerhana. It's okay. always fun. No and, uh, and we'll uh, proceed on. So we'll, thank yep. you. Okay, talk to you later. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye-bye. Welcome to Self-Publishing Authors, home for candid talks and honest recommendations from book editing to book marketing, from author journeys to inspirations, Hosted by Gurhan Demirkan.